Um, all right, so I'm going to use one figure only uh, to uh, talk about health. Now, for the demographers in the room, this is the, what I'm going to show you is called the distribution of death. For the non-demographers in the room, it's called the distribution of death. It basically presents a picture of what death looks like or what mortality or survival looks like in a population. Uh, and it's, I mean, think of it this way. If you took 100,000 babies born in a given year and you applied to those babies the death rates at all ages and you plotted out the ages at which they all died, you would get a distribution of death. So the area under the curve is the same no matter when you look at it. It tells you a critically important story about where we've come from, where we are, and where we're headed. This is the distribution of death for 19, a population in 1900. You can see high infant and child mortality. Uh, this is for females, so you can see maternal mortality right here at about age 20. But if you made it past the first couple of decades of life, you had a decent distribution of living out, decent probability of living out into your 50s, 60s, and 70s. What did we do during the course of the 20th century? We dramatically brought down early age mortality, uh, infectious diseases principally. We redistributed death from the young to the old. We built what I refer to as the mortality mountain. So this distribution here is where we are today in all developed nations and for subgroups in developing nations. Now keep in mind that the, while the risk of death has gone down for humans, for, for especially in long-lived populations, the age trajectory of death has never changed. There is a consistent pattern to the timing of death in humans that, that has never changed. Now, here's where the issue of health comes into play. What I have done is I've placed this concept of, of life extension, and really this is what we're talking about when we talk about longevity. I've placed this concept of life extension within the backdrop of frailty and disability. And I, I use what I refer to as the red zone as an example to understand this. Now, if you're a fan of American football uh, and you know anything about the city that I come from, the Chicago Bears, you know that when the Chicago Bears get the football down to the 20-yard line, it's almost impossible to score a touchdown. It's very difficult to move the ball any further. The same thing applies to longevity. Once a population reaches a very high number, a life expectancy upwards of 80 or higher, as we've achieved in long-lived populations, it becomes increasingly more difficult to raise life expectancy further. So that's part of what Aubrey's going to talk about in a couple of minutes. But with regard to health, what we've done is we've pushed out the envelope of survival further and further into the red zone. And the red zone is a time in which frailty and disability increases exponentially, just like the risk of death increases exponentially. The risk of death doubles about every seven to eight years in humans past puberty. The risk of frailty and disability doubles at roughly the same pattern. It varies from one cause to another. But here's the dilemma, and here's what we've done to ourselves. We've very successfully pushed out the distribution of death so that most deaths in long-lived populations now occur between the ages of 65 and 95. That's where death occurs. That's where frailty and disability occurs. What are we trying to do? We're attacking the diseases that are now facing us. Early, earlier on in the early 20th century, we attacked communicable diseases. We succeeded in large measure. There was a trade-off. The early age mortality declined. Those individuals now lived long enough to experience the basic biological process of aging. So the rise of heart disease, the rise of cancer, the rise of stroke, the rise of sensory impairments, all of these are a consequence of pushing out the envelope of survival into an age window where these diseases have an opportunity to be expressed. They're not our fault. Now, here's the dilemma. The longer we live, the more we push out survival further and further into the red zone, the higher the probability that we're going to face multiple diseases and multiple health risks. In epidemiology and public health, this is called competing risks. It's the same thing with football. Once you get the ball to the 20-yard line, you have a lot of defensive players that are clustered within a very short 
area. In human bodies, you have a large number of diseases that are clustered in aging bodies. You open up the body of a 100-year-old, any one of a number of diseases or, or disorders could kill that individual at, at, any, uh, at any one time. So the dilemma is, is that we've created this mountain of mortality in a red zone where the risk of frailty and disability is exceedingly high. So there is a new movement underway now. Well, actually, let me step back before I talk about the new movement. The current approach to dealing with, it, with this dilemma that we've created is to attack the diseases that are now being expressed in this region of the lifespan. What are we trying to do? We're trying to attack heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's. One disease at a time. As if somehow these diseases are all unrelated to each other. When in fact, the underlying risk factor for almost everything that goes wrong with us as we grow older, both in terms of, of, of the diseases that we experience, but the frailty and disability associated with it, is related to the biological, the underlying biological process of aging, which so far we can't do anything about. Now you're gonna hear a little bit about this from Audrey, Aubrey, but here's the dilemma. If we continue to make progress against heart disease, cancer, stroke, we will expose the survivors to an elevated risk of a, a suite of, of conditions of frailty and disability that are gonna raise levels of frailty and, and disability among future elderly cohorts. Let me be clear, life extension in today's world by going after one disease at a time, in my view, will be harmful. The survivors will experience in all likelihood an elevated risk of Alzheimer's disease and other neurological conditions these are the types, these are the Achilles heels of the human body that we currently cannot do anything about. Now, I'm hopeful that eventually we will be able to do that. So what does all of this mean? It means that we need to change the way in which we think about aging. We need to change the way in which we think about disease. And instead of just attacking one disease at a time, as if they're all independent of each other, we suggest, my colleagues and I, and there's a whole group of scientists across the globe that have come together to push this line of reasoning. It's called the longevity dividend or gero science, where we're now suggesting that the time has arrived to slow the biological process of aging. The impact will be a reduction in the risk of death from all of the major fatal diseases. Everything will be delayed. What are we trying to do? We're trying to compress the red zone. This is the critical thing that we're trying to influence. We're not trying to push out the distribution of survival. We're not trying to make us live longer. Life extension is not the goal. Health extension is the only goal of aging science, those of us that are working in this field uh, today. Now, truth be told, we probably will live a little bit longer if we achieve health extension, but we, that's not really the goal. And I've run out of time, so thank you for your attention.